Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a textbook I've written called Programming Language Foundations in Agda. Uh, I'll be speaking sometimes, I think, as if I did this on my own, but I did not do it on my own. Uh, Wen Kaka was a huge help while I was writing the book. Once the book was written and published, Jeremy Seek contributed a part three on denotational semantics. So um, I, I, if I forget to mention my co-authors as appropriate, they are actually very important uh, to what has happened. And uh, I want to acknowledge them here. So you've just met Fonda. She's from Rio de Janeiro. And so I was actually on sabbatical in Rio de Janeiro when I wrote this textbook. And as you can see, Rio de Janeiro is a fantastic place to be writing about functional programming because literally, the streets are paved with lambdas. So here's a pavement uh, near our flat in Rio de Janeiro. Here's a different pavement near our flat. You find lambdas just everywhere along the pavement. And then here's me. Uh, that wasn't during lock-in, but that's before uh, Vanda taught me to get my hair nice and short. Uh, so that's me working on the textbook uh, in our dining room. Okay, so um, I want to begin by explaining a little bit of background. So the first bit of background, of course, is about bugs, right? Bugs are to be avoided. Uh, I've, I always explain this quote to my student, always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. And in particular, I, I tell them to think of a particular violent psychopath, Batman, right? I warn them that if they code badly, this is what Batman will do to them, right? He'll take them up to a roof somewhere, hang them over to the edge, and get them to confess to their code. Let me just stop sharing for a minute, right? When, when I'm doing this re remotely, um, I actually have a little Batman that I can wave at them from time to time. I better go back to sharing now. Right, so there's Batman. Um, the other important piece of background is dad jokes. So I'm a dad. Here are my um, children, Adam and Leora. And I would, of course, being a dad, tell them dad jokes. And I could tell they were dad jokes because when I would say one of these, they would both look at me and in unison, they're twins, in unison they would say, dad. Of course, one form of dad jokes is puns and I love puns. And my favorite pun is what's called the uh, Curry-Howard isomorphism or propositions as types. And that gives us a correspondence between programming along the top here and logic along the bottom here. So there's a strict correspondence between implication, sorry, between functions and implication, between pairs, tuples, and conjunction, between um, disjoint sums and, uh, sorry, pairs and conjunction, disjoint sums and uh, disjunction, and for instance, the empty type and false. So as an example of this, what does it mean to have a proof that A implies B? It means I've got a function that given an A returns a B. So if I have a proof of A, I can feed that into my function. I get a proof of B and that means that whenever A is true, B must also be true. If I can prove A, I can also prove B, and so A implies B. Similarly, a conjunction is a pair. So what does it mean to know that A and B is true? Uh, a proof that A and B are true consists of a pair of things, a proof of A and a proof of B. So that means if I know, um, so that identifies the idea of A and B with having proofs of both of them. Similarly, A or B is true only if I have a proof of A or a proof of B. 
false corresponds to the empty type because it has no proofs. So that's an example of this idea. And um, that's going to be important. It sort of ended up being the, I didn't realize this when I, I began doing my research, uh, but that ended up being the foundation of my research career, this correspondence. So I wrote this textbook. That's called Programming Language Foundations in Agda. And anybody who knows me know that, knows that if I write something, the title must be a pun. So where is the pun here? Well, as was mentioned, uh, the pun has to do with how you parenthesize it. So we can say that we're talking about programming languages, and these programming languages have foundations, which I'm going to explain in Agda, or thanks to this notion of propositions as types, what we can do is say we're talking about language foundations, and we're going to be programming those up in Agda, right? Because our code is going to correspond to proofs of properties of programs. And of course, this is where bugs come into it. We're going to try to keep Batman from dropping us off a roof by writing code and proving that that code satisfies certain properties. Let me just go out of this for a minute. So let me just um, show you the textbook. So it's freely available online. Here it is. Uh, so part one is logical foundations. That is how to use Agda to prove things. So we begin with natural numbers, induction relations. How do you define equality? What are isomorphisms? How do you do conjunction and disjunction and so on? And then part two, we actually do programming language foundations. So um, it's all based around Lambda calculus. We do uh, Lambda calculus, properties of lambda calculus, a different way of representing lambda calculus. This is what's called uh, extrinsic. We have separate typing rules. This is what's called intrinsic. We build the types into our syntax. Then we do all of simply typed lambda calculus, things like products and sums and lists. Uh, we talk about how to relate things with by simulation, doing type inference, which is very important because uh, extrinsic, you write down your code and then you separately have a derivation showing that that code is type correct. Here, basically what you do is you write down the type derivation as your code. So type inference, which looks at a term and works out what its type derivation is, if it has one, um, type inference takes extrinsic into intrinsic. Then I look a bit at untyped lambda calculus, uh, and things like confluence or the big step representation. These two chapters were added later by Jeremy, by the way. And then part three, which was written by Jeremy, is denotational semantics. He has a particularly simple approach to denotational semantics. So people have been formalizing this for a long time. Standard formalizations of denotational semantics are like 10,000 lines in Calk, but um, Jeremy has done a much briefer but complete formalization here, so that's a nice bit of work that he did, inspired by parts one and two of the book. I said, oh, you should do that in Agda. He said, okay, and did it. Uh, some of you familiar with the field will know that, ooh, <coughs> oh dear, excuse me. No, I'm not coming down with COVID. I cough all the time. Um, some of you will know that there's an earlier textbook in this area, also freely available online, Software Foundations by um, Benjamin Pierce and many, many other people. It's now up to five volumes because Andrew Pell has added something on algorithms and something on proving programs in C. And uh, Benjamin added another chapter on um, QuickCheck, which is QuickCheck, but uh, for Calk. Um, so this is a great book. I taught from this book for five years and after doing that, I thought I'd really much rather be doing it in Agda. There are significant advantages to doing it in Agda. The um, great strength of Calk is that you've got proof tactics. And because of that, right, huge things have been done in Calk. Uh, Xavier Leroy has written a complete compiler for C in Calk. Um, and sorry, a compiler for C 
a specification of the source language, a specification of the target language, the whole compiler, and then a proof that the compiler preserves the semantics of the source language in the target language. Making use of tactics to do proofs. So tactics basically you say, here's my goal, and then the tactic lets you break that down into sub goals. And so you can do large things. You can do things like proof of C compiler correct. You can do things like the entire formal proof of the four color theorem, which was very significant because the original proof of the four color theorem involved a 10,000 line program written in Fortran. And you, know, you could see why as a mathematician, you might have doubts that that's correct. So formalizing the whole thing as Georges Rantier did is quite significant. So those sorts of large developments are harder to do in Agda. But for teaching, I think Agda is superior. So um, the first thing I did when I wrote this textbook, right, the first question was, will it be possible? Because this textbook, right, is written using proof tactics throughout. So if you don't have proof tactics available, right, maybe the code gets much larger. Maybe it's impossible to do. So what I discovered by writing this book is, nope, it's not impossible. And I can just tell you empirically that the size of the proofs written out in full is about the same as the size of the proofs written in tactics in software foundations. The big difference is a proof written in tactics, you can't just sit down and read it. You have to execute it, right? You execute the tactics to find out how your goal gets turned into sub goals. So um, I, the an analogy I use is that um, trying to read a proof written in tactics is like, uh, if you tried to read it without executing it, it would be like trying to understand a chess game written down in chess notation. And you can't do that, right? You have to use the chess notation to play it on a chess board, and then you understand what's going on. So these similarly, um, you can get understanding by executing them dynamically, but not by reading them. Whereas in Agda, you just write down the proof. You don't have something that you need to execute. So the proof can be read. And I think that's a big advantage. But the question was, can we even do this? Maybe the proofs become too long. Answer, nope, they don't become too long. So that's uh, a nice thing that was discovered along the way. And then the benefit of doing it in Agda is a, you're using a language that looks a bit like Haskell rather than a language that looks a bit like OCaml. Um, but B, much more importantly, you're actually writing out the proofs so the proofs can be read. Okay, so here it is. And let's just go to chapter one. Right, and um, so you can, this is freely available online, right? And you can just download it and start reading it. Um, I guess many of you will know the bit in the, of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where he goes, space is big. It's just really big. You can't imagine how big space is. So I begin very similarly talking about the night sky and how many stars are in it, right? There are 70 sextillion stars in the known universe, in the observable universe. Um, that's a huge number, but it is still finite. So here's something even bigger than all those stars in the sky, zero, one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. Right? And that dot, dot, dot is significant. That's hiding an infinite number of things. And one thing that I try to get my students excited about, right, is that in three lines, we can define infinity, right? So data, that n is a set where zero is a natural number and successor is a constructor that given a natural number returns another natural number. Um, sometimes we write these out more informally. So you, you can see this is in black. That means it's just something, it's just an example written out as text. This is in color, meaning it's in Agda and it's actually was 
has been executed in order to colorize it. So that's very important. Whenever something is in color in the textbook, you know it's correct. It actually runs. If something's in black and white, like here or here, it's just something I wrote. It could have a typo, but this is something that I wrote and then executed. So the um, type checker of Agda is guaranteeing that um, there's a whole slew of errors that just cannot be occurring here. So that stuff being in color is really important. And then we can see, right, red is for keywords, green is for constructors, and blue is for names that are defined, like here, fat N. And so this should be pretty familiar to most people. Does anybody want to ask a question about this at this point? Right, so this just says zero is a natural number and says if M is a natural number, then successor of M is also a natural number. So we do that by saying suck takes a natural and returns a natural. It's a constructor that does that. And by being in green, by being a constructor, that means we can pattern match on it. We'll see an example of that in a minute. So I'll just check, are there any hands up there? Are there any questions to be relayed to me? Um, do the thumbs up or nods heads if you're happy and somebody, wait, I'll just stop sharing for a moment. Yeah, well, I, I was just gonna say, Philip, that there's no questions at this time. There's a, a praise in the, in the Q&A. I can quote that to you. Not a question, but thank you, Professor, for the best popular paper on monads, monads for functional progr programming I've ever read. Oh, thank you very much. I see lots of uh, thumbs up, so that's yeah. great. So I'll just go back yeah. to sharing then. Thank you. Okay, so let's. Uh... Right, so. That's it, three lines, and we've defined all the natural numbers. And as I've mentioned, the whole textbook is available freely online, and this means that you can download it from Git and execute it. Oh, this is something actually that I want to explain. Let's go back here. Oops, go back here for a minute. If you go back to the title page, right, you see it actually gives you the link to GitHub. Right, so here it is, you, you, you've got the book here, um, you can download it and so on. One of the important things you can do is you can make pull requests, right? So I mentioned that uh, in the bit that's not executable Agda, there might be typos. And the, I encourage everybody, all your textbooks, all your technical papers, publish them on GitHub. Because what that means is when you make an error, somebody else can correct it for you and submit it as a pull request. So this is fantastic. So the book is much better than it was when first published because of all the pull requests I've received from readers saying, well, wouldn't it be clear if you did this or there's a typo here? Um, more than I want to admit are about typos. And then uh, Wen, who did the, she did the entire um, infrastructure for the book. She set that all up. And part of the infrastructure she set up is something that looks at the GitHub repository, checks what pull requests uh, we have accepted, and sorts that in order from most pull requests accepted to least, and puts that in as a section of the acknowledgments of the book. So um, please read the book, please send corrections, and then those corrections will get sent and added to the uh, acknowledgments of the book. So right at the end, the back matter, we've got the acknowledgments. And you can see, right, this is types out automatically. These are all the people who have helped us improve the book. Um, props to Marco, who has um, done the most corrections. So all these people towards the top, uh, especially the first few, have really done quite a lot to help make the book better. And thank you to those people, right? And right, everything in the world is a, um, anything of value is going to be done as a collaboration. So setting things up so that it's easy for people to collaborate, that's really important. And right, it says even in the list of acknowledgements, your name goes here. Okay, so that's the book. Let's go back, let's go here. So you can download the book. Here's the downloaded version. You can actually execute it. 
Now you notice that right now, this all appears in black and white, but if I type control C, control L, something very important happens. You get this little window at the bottom, and then after a while, it takes a minute, it's in color, right? All the bits that are code are now in color. And this is very important, as I said, because if it's in color, that means it's correct. If I made an error, right? So I mentioned, right, set is the name in um, ABDA. It really means type. So when we're saying n colon set, that means fat n is a new type that we're defining. So if I goofed, I misspelled set as type, what would happen? If I type control C, oh, look, I get an error message down here, right? And it leaves everything in black and white and it shows me where the type error is. In this case, the type error is I typed the wrong thing. My shift typed here is set. So if we make an error in that bit of code, it gets automatically corrected for us. So that's nice and executable. And then we can do things with that. So for instance, we can define plus on two numbers. The plus takes a natural and a natural and returns a natural. And here we're using pattern matching, right? So we pattern match on the first argument. So our first argument is either going to be zero or it's going to be the successor of a natural number, call that M. And zero plus n is just n. Successor of m plus n is, right, re use recursion to add n to n, and then take the successor of that. So we can do an example. And you notice this example again is in color, which means that Agda has type checked it. And right, if we write two plus three, so Agda, you can actually give it the uh, pragma that tells it that two plus three is shorthand for um, successor of successor of zero plus successor of successor of successor of zero. Um, and that means, right, so this is two plus three. So we compute that by taking one and adding it to three. And then we compute one plus three by taking the, right, one is the successor of zero. Then we take zero and add it to three, and that's three, right? And when we do this, right, we convert two plus three into the successor of one plus three, into the successor of the successor of zero plus three, into the successor of the successor of three, which is five, right? And all the code here, has been checked. If I wrote four by mistake, it's unhappy. I know that it right some things it won't fix. If I put these two lines in a different order, completely happy with that. I better put it back. I don't want the book to be wrong. It's happy if you put things in the wrong order, but it's checked on each line, right? It's computed the value of two plus three. It's computed the value of this. Each of these, it's computed the value. And it's checked that they all have the same value. So it's proved, uh, sorry. So it knows that each of these lines must be equal to the other line. So it's checked that. So some things you need to put in a way that makes sense, but some things that Agda can actually check for you. So, right, that's how you use recursion to define addition, and this is really exciting, right? Because how many numbers have we defined addition for? All of them, right? So in just, how many lines did we have for the definition? Three, I think. Right, so in these three lines, we've, um, completely defined what it means to add natural numbers, right? And, and right when you were in grade school, you went through memorizing your addition tables, right? All, all possible combinations of the numbers from zero to nine added to numbers from zero to nine. You had to memorize that and then you had to learn how to um, do multi-digit numbers and do carries and so on. But all of that, right? We can capture all of that in just 
these three lines, and that captures every single natural number there is, all infinity of them. Those of you that are familiar with Haskell, you'll see that this is, is quite similar. Um, there are a couple of differences, right? In Haskell, we'd write two colons here. In Agda, we write one. In Haskell, we'd write plus in parentheses. Here we write underbar plus underbar, and that's because Agda actually supports multi-fix notation. Um, so the, here we've got an infix operator, but you can do if underbar, then underbar, else underbar, or what have you. You can do um, substitution is underbar, open square bracket, underbar, colon equals underbar, close square bracket. So you can do multi-fix notation, which is very handy and used throughout the book. So these, the fact that Agda um, lets you prove things, which we'll see in a moment, um, but also write these small syntactic improvements, things like uh, multi-fix notation are why I say Agda is what Haskell wants to be when it grows up. And I didn't know Agda when I started writing the textbook, um, when knew Agda, and she helped me enormously. Uh, and other people like Connor McBride, who helped invent Agda, uh, the good ideas and some of the good ideas in Agda, uh, and James McKenna helped educate me to do things the right way. Um, and it was just a joy, right? This is the great thing about being an academic is um, you get to learn new things and you have clever people who will teach you about them. So that's just an amazing joy. I'm so grateful to Wen and Connor and James and everybody else who helped me learn Agda. And then I hope that by writing this textbook, others of you can share in this joy. So there is the complete definition of addition. Let me just stop sharing for one second and ask, are there any questions about that? Do a thumbs up if you're happy. Lots of thumbs up. Anybody want to ask a question yet? Okay, you should be sure to ask questions if you don't follow, please do. Uh, but just for now, I'm gonna go back to well, sharing. So, so there, there are some questions, Philip. I, I can take one, at least one of them. Okay, are they, uh, I can see them as well, hold on. Okay, great. Let me just cancel sharing for a moment. Right, right so there are some questions, but I'm gonna leave those for the end. Yeah. I mainly want to get questions about if, if I said something that wasn't clear, it's really important that people do ask a question. But in this case, I'll just go on back to sharing. And the other thing I want to show you is I'm just going to go on to the next chapter of the book. Oops, it's right here. Oh, right. Wait, let's. Again, right, if we made an error here, right, if we did something like, um, oops, let's not do that. Sorry, very slow typing. Oh, that's very bad. Uh, there we go. Uh, so if I mistyped, right, if I wrote NN there again, it will give us an error message. And if I fix it, so I've written a correct definition, everything's in color. And most importantly, right, the really exciting thing here is look at this space. There's nothing in it, no error messages. So the, the thing that really should give you a rush is seeing this space blank. Although actually what makes me, what gives me a rush is when this bit turns into color, then I know that Ag is happy with it. So that's very important to me. Uh, okay, so let's go on and let's look at induction. So, um, there we go. Right, so here's an example, the associative law. And this says, right, m plus n plus p, no matter which way you parenthesize that, you get the same answer, right? And that's not completely obvious because, oh, good, it's turned into color, right? Three plus four plus five 
parenthesized one way, parenthesized the other way, right? Three plus four is seven. So we've got seven plus five. The other way around, four plus five is nine. Oh yeah, so seven plus five and three plus nine are the same thing. They are both 12. But does that always have to happen, right? We just did one test case. How many test cases would we have to look at to prove this for every natural number? Infinity! In fact, infinity times infinity times infinity, but because of the way infinity works, that's just infinity. But there are an infinite number of things we'd have to look at to keep Batman off our back. That would sort of be a problem. So what are we gonna do? We'd like to prove this. So to prove it, we're gonna use what's called proof by induction. So here's the thing we want to prove is that for every m, n, and p, which are natural numbers, it is the case that m plus n plus p, parenthesized one way, is m plus n plus p, parenthesized the other way. Okay, now, this is actually a function, right? The way we could write the type of this is, uh, that n goes to, that n goes to, that n goes to, oh, why is that doing the wrong thing? That's why, capital X on. Something, right? And what is the something? This dot, dot, dot is m plus n plus p is equal to m plus n plus p. So this is a, just a function that takes three numbers and returns a proof that those three added up one way is equal to those three added it up the other way. But to be able to write this down right, I can't just say I've got three natural numbers. I have to know what they're called. They're called M, N, and P. So instead of writing the type this way, I'm going to write this way. Right? The type of addition, remember, Could have just written that instead. Right? It would have been equivalent. To write that. Those are. the arguments, which is, sorry, on the value of the arguments, which is why we put in variable names for each of the arguments here, okay? Again, I'll pause and see if there are any questions about that. Okay, so this is just an ordinary function, which we can define using recursion, and we'll do pattern matching again. So we've got three arguments now, m, n, and p, and we'll look at two cases. One is the case that n is zero, and one is the case that n, that the first argument is the successor of some number m. So if it's zero, what we need to show is, right, m plus n plus p parenthesis one way. So that's zero plus n plus p is the same as zero plus n plus p. And of course, we already know zero plus n simplifies to n, and zero plus stuff simplifies to stuff. So zero plus n plus p simplifies to n plus p. So both of these simplify to n plus p immediately. So that's a very easy base case of the definition or the proof. And then we've got an inductive case So both of these simplify, right? Because by the definition of addition, 
successor of m plus n is the same as the successor of m plus n. And the, the successor of m plus n, and we add p to that, is by definition the same as take m plus n, add it to p, and take the successor of that. The other way around, the successor of m plus n plus p is equal to the successor of m plus n plus p. So now we're done. If we can just show that m plus n plus p parenthesized one way is the same as m plus n plus p parenthesized the other way, and that's true by the inductive hypothesis. But another way of saying that is that's true by recursion. We just invoke plus a soak on m, n, and p. So plus a soak of successor of m and n and p is defined in terms of plus a soak of m and n and p, just like plus of successor of m and n was defined in terms of plus over m and n. So it's just recursion. So this is quite nice. You can see that induction and recursion are the same thing, which is just another example of propositions as types or the Curry-Howard isomorphism. Okay, so that's it. That's our complete proof. Um, that's all I want to show you, really. I will mention, right, we can get Amka to help out with this. If I didn't have this proof, let's comment it out. I didn't have this proof. I began by saying, all right, I want to know what plus soak M, N, and P is equal to. It gives me this little thing, which is called a hole. And if I go into the hole, I can say, do a case split on M. Zap! And it gives me, okay, I need to fill in, uh, right? One case is zero and the other case is for successor of N. And then this hole I can fill in with this proof. Alas, Ag is not so good at um, helping you write little equational proofs like this. That would be a nice extension to Agda as something helping something that would help you to do those equational proofs. Just restore this to where it was. And if you go through the textbook in chapter four, you see how to define equality and how to define things like these, this notation for equational proofs. Later, I use a similar notation for reduction sequences. So you can um, look at reduction sequences of lambda terms. Okay, let's just stop sharing for a moment. That's the main thing I wanted to do, show you. I just wanted to take you through uh, a wee bit of the textbook there. Are there any questions, anything people didn't understand at this point? Okay, so there's one question here I can see. Uh, Nicholas asks, why not suck m plus n equals m plus suck n? for tail recursion in slightly simpler rewrites? Uh, is it because the terms need to be smaller on the left? So um, yes, terms do need to be smaller on the left. So the particular thing that you wrote wouldn't work, something that would work and that you can prove is equivalent is to define m plus suck n is equal to the successor of m plus n. That also works. Uh, but you're right, you wouldn't want to do it this way because we need to define plus of larger things in terms of plus on smaller things. Otherwise, we would go on forever. It would be a bit like defining, um, to use a joke from Edwin Brady, Brexit equals Brexit. Okay. There's uh -oh. also a uh, there... from Camilla, so I'm gonna hand the uh, microphone to Camilla so we, she can ask a question. Okay. Oh, yes, my camera is not working today. Um, yeah, but I was wondering about the collaboration uh, of the book. Did you create it on GitHub, like a soft, other software product, and then collaborate? Was it in Markdown from the get go? Or yes, I can see you've also got the question. I'm, I'm afraid you broke up a bit. 
Uh, oh, okay. I was wondering if you put it on GitHub in the beginning, like uh, like you would any software product and collaborated from there, if it was in markup from the beginning. Right. Was it in markup and GitHub from the start? Yes. Yes, it was. Oh, awesome. That's yes, uh, it is awesome. Pretty, it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a great way to write a textbook. It's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. Right. And in particular, right, being able to write it in Agda that executes and therefore yeah. guarantees that that part is correct. That's just a huge benefit. I strongly encourage people to write their papers that way as well. Yeah, that is. Right. And uh, when you do that, make sure to put all the Agda you're using in the paper you're writing, because then you've explained it to the computer. If you've put yeah. enough in there that the computer can follow it, then the reader is sure to be able to follow it as well. Um, I've read some papers written in literate Agda, but people would hide bits of the literal literate Agda code. And then I try to read and I go, I don't understand what's going on here. I would have to go back. Fortunately, that paper said the whole paper is in a repository here. You can see the source code. So I went back wow. and looked at the source code and then I understood what they were saying. Oh, that's awesome. So I that, think you can do the this in Haskell. It gave well. me a way to work it out. But please yeah. put the Agda in the actual published paper. It's just a huge help. Yeah. Uh, I think you can do this with Haskell as well. Okay. Yes, there okay. are. Thanks yeah. for living at Haskell. And I strongly encourage people to use them. It's a great yeah. idea. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks for a great talk. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm not actually quite done with the talk yet. I'll just do five minutes on cryptocurrency, because I think I promised in the abstract I'd say a bit about cryptocurrency. So let me do that. Uh, let me just go back to sharing. I'm just going to skip over some stuff. I'm going to mention one important thing. So the, once Act is explained, just somebody say something, because I want to make sure somebody can hear me. Yes, you're visible and... Uh, yes, okay, great. Um, just one thing I want to explain uh, is that when I wrote the textbook, there were systems in use like the K... Um, so this doesn't appear in the name of, of the paper, but uh, Grigori Rosu, with many other people, has de developed something called the K framework, and then Robbie Findler and many other people have done developed Red X. So these are things you give them reduction rules and they will actually then, um, you give it a term and it will reduce it according to the reduction rules. So that's called animation. Um, so this is an example of paper that quotes, if you're um, using small step, just little reduction steps, definitions, you can turn that into an evaluator uh, by using one of these systems, something like K, or uh, Red X. So I had K and Red X Envy when I was first writing the textbook. I thought, I want to be able to do that. How can I do that? And I was really quite concerned about this. So Software Foundations, Benjamin Pierce's book, can use these tactics. To, so it has a tactic that repeatedly applies reduction rules to simplify a term. What was I going to do to be comparable to that? And um, I really fretted about this while I was writing the textbook until eventually it occurred to me that it is completely obvious. Um, so I felt very stupid when I finally realized it was obvious. I think it's been obvious to other people that have also not mentioned it. So like this person didn't mention it. They said, if you want to reduce things, you've got to use something like K or Red X. Another example, right? Here's the normalized tactic, which is in Software Foundations. That's how it's done there. Um, Right, Benjamin Way wrote his talk, he mentioned, right, lack of animation facilities as a problem with doing all this, right? He had to write this tactic in COG. Um, and then in the Poplemark challenge, right, they set this task. The first task is prove these theorems that everybody proves about lambda calculus called preservation and progress. So preservation says if a term is well typed and it takes a reduction step, then the result is also well typed in the same context. And if a term is closed and well typed, so in other words, if in no context, small t has type big T, then either T is a value or there's some other term T prime such that T reduces to T prime. So these are standard theorems. You also find them proved in Agda, in PLFA. Um, 
And I did that early on. That was practically the first thing I did was I copied the proof from software foundations to make sure I could do it. Um, so I knew I could do that, but then I wanted animation. So like in the Popplemark challenge, one animation is proof preservation and progress. A completely different challenge is prove that you can animate things, right? Given a, a, a term T, find a term T prime such that T reduces to T prime. And if you iterate that, you could reduce T to a value. Um, oh, wait. So here's the obvious thing that took six months to occur to me. We've just proved these two results. So this says, wait a minute, I give it a proof, right? What is this written out as a constructive proof? It's a function. You give it the type derivation showing that T is well typed, and then it returns a disjunction. It'll either return a proof that T is a value, a derivation showing T is a value, or it will return a reduction step. It will return T prime paired with the reduction step showing that T reduces to T prime. Oh, right, and then I can use preservation to show that since T was well typed and T reduces to T prime, T prime is well typed. And then I've got the hypothesis for this theorem satisfied again. I can just go through and reduce the term. So there's actually some code in the book that applies the proof of preservation and progress to do this. Um, so once you've proved preservation and progress, you get animation for free. And this is completely obvious, but as far as I can tell, it was never published before. Um, you actually have complete textbooks like Bob Harper's great foundational textbook for programming languages. Um, but I asked Bob, you know, do you mention that in the textbook? He said, no, I didn't mention it. It's obvious. You don't need to mention it. Um, so my textbook, because I'm not as clever as Bob, my textbook mentions the obvious. I hope having mentioned the obvious, it now will be obvious to everybody and people won't need to rediscover the wheel like I did. Okay, so that's one point. The other point is I wanted to mention that, um, so I work as a consultant for IOHK. IOHK is a blockchain firm. They um, have a product called Cardano. Uh, Cardano just went up in the um, stakes for, um, uh, what its total value is. So it's now up to, I think, $28 billion worth of ADA. ADA is the cryptocurrency in Cardano. So that's not as much as Bitcoin, which is like a trillion. And it's not as much as Ethereum, which is like 200 billion. And it's not as much as Tether, which is um, a, a, a cryptocurrency that's tethered in value to the US dollar. So there's a total of, I think, 33 billion worth of, of uh, Tether, but next comes Cardano with 28 billion. So we're catching up on Tether. We'll see if we catch up on the other ones. Um, so you've, we've got these smart contracts that run. What do you write the smart contracts in? So um, for Cardano, the answer is you write them in Haskell. There, we have a, um, a smart contract language called Plutus. Plutus is just a library for Haskell and we have people like um, Manuel Chakravati is leading the team. I work with the team. We have people on the team like Michael Peyton Jones. That might seem like a familiar um, name because he's Simon's son. Uh, so these are the people leading the team. We've got lots of clever people on the team doing this. So um, Haskell, of course, is a very complicated language. You'd like to actually be able to verify your smart contracts. And Haskell is a bit too large to verify. So here's the team with Manuel and Michael. Uh, and one member of the team is James Chapman. And what we decided to do, I can show you this here. We've got Plutus Core, which is just um, something called the polymorphic lambda calculus or system F. It was uh, discovered once by John Reynolds right, who called it polymorphic lambda calculus, and once by Jean-Yves Girard, who called it system F. Um, so back in the 70s, these guys independently came up with the same thing. And this is just what Plutus Core is. It's exactly that. 
plus um, type application, no, type application is part of it, sorry, plus uh, recursive types. So we've got wrap and unwrap for dealing with recursive types. So it's just what was discovered in the 70s plus recursive types. And that is literally what runs on the blockchain. Turns out the Haskell compiler already compiles to something called Haskell Core, which is very similar to this, this plus a few things. So we use that to compile Haskell into exactly this, and this is what runs on the blockchain. So we actually had a business case for writing out the specification of this thing in Agda. I used my textbook as a model and then handed over to, oops, where'd it go? Oh, here, wait for it to pop up again. Uh, this man, James Chapman, who's one of the world experts in doing this sort of thing. So we had a business case to hire James and then James did the very easy bit of the specification. I did this, and then James did all the hard bits, which are proving preservation and progress, and then, which is much, much longer, right? It, that doesn't just fit on a napkin like this would do. Um, and then having proved those things, just like I showed you, you actually get an evaluator. So our actual evaluator is, of course, written in Haskell, but we test that evaluator versus the theorems that we've proved in Agda. So we just generate random terms, reduce them using preservation and progress in Agda, and reduce them using the Haskell evaluator and check that we get the same answer. So um, Agda has actually been applied to um, increase our confidence that we've done the right thing for this blockchain, which you'd like to do, right? Because there are billions of um, dollars worth of cryptocurrency there, so you'd like to get it right. So, Philip, there's a I stop now. So I, yeah. I will stop there. Um, I did bring a. Let me stop sharing. Uh, I did bring a special guest. Let me just go off and bring him here, and that'll be the end of the talk. Okay. Just give me one minute, and you decide which questions you want to ask. If there's time for a question, but let me just bring in the special guest. One moment. Oh, yes. Hi, Chums. I'm afraid I had to drag Phil away. He went overtime, and that's a crime. I just am here to remind you, don't put bugs in your programs. I'll have to come after you. Yep. We will all be careful. We don't want Batman visiting. So I'm back now. That's the end of the talk. Thank you all very much. My apologies for going overtime.